Let me introduce you to a man who's made a movie. And it's a very good movie. I sat down and watched it last night. Matt Bauer, and it's, uh, the movie's called The Other Fellow. Uh, and again, I must apologise to my guests for having to get you to negotiate the road that is being dug up and replaced, and uh, you, you managed to get here. Thank look, you. Look, I, ju- I just managed, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. There are, there are harder radio stations to get into than your beautiful home here, so yes. Well, I can't imagine that being the case, but it's kind of you to say so. Uh, I, I just the uh, best laid plans of mice and men, you know. Just when you think you've got everything figured in and factored up, uh, I, know, I hope it's not causing you chaos out there today, Jeremy, with your other guests. No, um, no. Well, I, I think it's I think it's covered. We will be all right. Yeah, I watched the movie and I thought to myself, "Wow, what a good idea!" Is this your first? This is my first film. Uh, yes, it was my first feature film. Uh, yes, getting a feature. F- <laughs> Getting a feature film up must be incredibly difficult. You've got to raise the money. You've got to stimulate the interest. You've got to find lots of people with whom to do it. I, yeah. don't, know, I don't know how. It's, it's a challenge. I, mean, at, at, I remember at film school, it, it, the, the biggest thing I learned about film producing, at film school they gave us, it's, it's a chart and it's a triangle. And it's, there are three corners of the triangle which are fast, cheap and good. Right. And they say to you, you can only ever have two of these things. So if you want it cheap and fast, it won't be good. You know what I mean? If you want yeah. it fast and good, it won't be cheap. Um, and for myself and I think for a lot of first-time filmmakers, I went the uh, good and cheap, well, hopefully good, uh, <laughs> and cheap route, um, which meant it wasn't kind of fast. Um, so this film took me nine years to make. Um, and look, on average, especially in documentaries, generally from conception to their release is about seven years. Um, these things do take a long time. Um, but especially what I like with documentary is you can just slowly film something bit by bit over time. Um, whereas in you know fictionalized film, you've got to get all the money together and then go and do a full two-week shoot And then the problem is you might not like what you've got after those two weeks, whereas thankfully with documentary, it's a bit more like sculpture. You can sort of slowly build it over time. But to write it, um, well, to first of all think of it, then to write it, uh, direct it, script it, yeah, script it, produce it. Yeah. Did you do it all? Uh, largely, yes, yes. I mean, I have a t- I have a team back in London um, who kind of helped, especially at the end, sort of getting it together. I mean, I think especially when you say right, it's a little bit different in documentary. I mean, you kind of have a bit of a plan going in, and then of course, sort of everything changes along the way as you shoot. And if if you've seen the film, um, uh, you, you know there there were. It, one, one of our ca- we'll get to who the characters are in a minute, I'm sure, Jeremy. But you know, one, <laughs> one of our characters is arrested for murder. Um, you know, during the course of the film, and that of course wasn't. Whoops. Yeah, that that wasn't the plan <laughs> going in. But then, of course, you know, as as I was googling these men, uh, suddenly it came up that you know one of them had been arrested for murder, and suddenly we were you know filming in prisons in America and that kind of thing. And so, with documentary, you kind of never know exactly where it's going to go, and it, it does sort of mean at the end of the filming process, you're sort of, in some ways, the script happens at the end as opposed to fiction where it happens at the beginning. Did you win an award for this? We've won some awards. Um, yes, I was, I was nominated. I, I should explain, I was born in Adelaide, but I, I live hmm. in London. But I was, I was long-listed for Best Debut Director um, at the British Independent Film Awards last year. Um, and we've won a few other awards and nominations on the film festival circuit as we've gone. We won one two weeks ago at a festival in Ohio, which was called the Human Spirit Award. <laughs> um, oh, well, I think that what, whatever you've won, you have got a lot more in your future. Uh, to me, the whole thing would be getting the idea would be very important, getting the original idea and polishing it up. But it would be getting the money, getting the backers together and then saying, well, this is my first movie. I can't sort of trot... Uh, past successes out to you, you're going to have to believe in me. How hard was it to raise the money? For for this, it it, it wasn't really a money thing. Essentially, we just shot very cheaply with this film, and I think that's for a lot of people with documentary. Um, You know, if you're doing like a feature, you know, a proper full-on feature film, you'll need to get a million dollars or maybe a 100,000 or something together. 
um, to do that sort of thing. Whereas for this, we just kind of, you know, I was filming with a lot of my friends from film school. Um, there's an old hack that a lot of film first time filmmakers do, which is that, you know, you know, you have to hire equipment, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with this sort of thing. Um, you need to hire equipment. And so what you'll often do is you'll, you'll rent the equipment on a Friday for one day, but because the equipment shop is closed on the Saturday, <laughs> you've got to drop it back on Monday morning. So you actually get three days for the price of one. And that's what a lot of sort of, sort of first time low budget filmmakers do. Um, and so that would kind of mean we'd have sort of three days to kind of shoot with. And I think this film was kind of made up of about 150 of those sort of shoots. Um, you know, but, but, you know, that costs something in, in a number of sort of hundreds of dollars, you know, rather than having to lay out sort of thousands all the time. Um, so it's kind of just being about kind of just smart with it, I think. Um, yeah. Any, any moments during the, what did you say, seven years that you were working on? Any moments where you say, oh, God, I can't do this anymore? You, you, have, a, you have a lot of those moments in film, yeah. And, and it's hard, you know. I, th- I think you have it with a lot of kind of, you know, people starting businesses and that sort of thing that, you know, there, there are some ideas where you should take them behind the barn and shoot them, if you know what I mean. And you have that thing where you go... Am I actually onto something here, or should I take this behind the barn and, and, and shoot it? You know, and I think you know, especially in documentary, you're kind of doing an edit all the time as you're going, and be, because you're still shooting at the same time, you're working on a film which is substandard pretty much up until the very end when you go, "Great, this is good enough. Let's let's yeah. release it out into yeah. the world." Yeah. Um, and it is tough. It, it is tough, and I think you know a lot of filmmakers go through a lot of sort of you know mental health challenges and struggles. Um, and I, you know, I always think even if you see a film and you go, "God, that was the worst movie I've ever seen," you still have to remember that people have put incredible amounts of work, uh, you know, and huge dedication into yeah. these things. Uh, I always have an issue with people that complain about continuity mistakes in films. Do you know what I mean? They'll, they'll see this amazing film that hundreds of people have spent years making. And they'll go, oh, yeah, but his, his glove was on, on the other, other hand, hand in, yeah. the, in the previous <laughs> shot. And you go, do you think the filmmakers don't know his glove was on the wrong hand? They just don't have <laughs> 10 grand to get the actor back to film it on the other hand or some VFX to do it. So you go, get over the glove being on the wrong hand and just appreciate the work that's gone into this. No, ab- absolutely. Now, let's get to the idea itself. Where, yes. W- was it a brainwave? or we, what, what, what were you doing when you thought about James Bond in this context? Uh, yeah, well, I should explain that the film The Other Fellow um, is it is a documentary about the lives of real men all over the world whose name is James Bond um, and what it is like f- to live in the shadow of the most famous fictional mm. character and fictional name, but also uh, the phenomena of James Bond and mm. kind of have this weird association with that every day. Um, and, I mean, I I was always a James Bond fan. Um, I was gr- growing up in Adelaide. I would probably say I was. I, I definitely felt like Adelaide's biggest James Bond fan. I was in you know, s- some local things here. I would go into a place called Antique Market in the city every oh, weekend. Yeah. There was another shop called Movie Maniacs, which I think is still <laughs> actually there. And I would go in every. This is before eBay and things, and go in every week to see if they had James Bond items and that sort of thing in there. Um, and then I think a combination of that, I, I finished film school um, and was looking for my first project. And weirdly, when Facebook first started, I was actually a member of a Facebook group for everyone who had the same name as me. So you could do this on Facebook. You could search for people who have the same name mm-hmm. as you. And so all the Matthew Bowers on Facebook came together in this group. And we would talk about these innocuous things like who's got Matt Bauer at gmail.com, who's got Matt Bauer.com, who's got the Instagram handle, who's got Matthew Bauer at gmail.com, these sort of things. <laughs> and somewhere in there I went, what if that but your name was James Bond? You know, just imagine not so much the martini jokes and that sort of thing, but just imagine the complications, especially in the digital age, mm-hmm. that would result if your name was James Bond. And, you know, you'll see when, when you've seen the film, um, you know, it's about what happens if, one man named James Bond is arrested, is charged with murder by the police, and there's another guy in the same town who's also called James Bond. What happens to him? Um, and then, uh, as becomes sort of primary in the film, is the fact that y- you actually can't be Googled if you have this name. You know, James Bond, in some ways, it does make you invisible in, in the digital world because if you, if you Google any of these guys, obviously 100,000 pictures of Pierce Brosnan... 
um, and that sort of thing pop up. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. there can be advantages and disadvantages to having a very common name. I actually, to just interject, Jeremy, as an experiment, when, I, when I'm being interviewed by people, I, I try and Google them on the internet to see if there <laughs> is another one of them. And as far as I can tell, you are the only Jeremy Cordeaux. Yeah, I think Almost so. Almost in existence, yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think you probably haven't had those problems of sharing a name with someone or or uh, there isn't another guy in Adelaide no, who gets I, I, your emails. No, I've never uh, never had anyone who wanted to take the name and I don't know what that tells <laughs> us about the name. Uh, <laughs> there was a yes. lady, oh golly, it's a long time ago, uh, there was a lady who popped up here in Adelaide. Uh, what was her name? Janice, yeah. Uh, and uh, she was... The only reason I suppose I even knew about her was that she was the uh, uh, public relations officer for John Martins. Uh-huh. Uh, this is going back into the 80s. And um, uh, Janice Cordeaux, and eventually I bumped into her and I said, I, I, the, the Cordeaux family is very, very small, really, yes. and I, I don't, I've never heard of a Janice Cordeaux. Yeah. Oh, she said, oh, no, 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 I just, I just like the name. I just took the name. Yeah, uh, and I said, "Oh well, that's a lovely compliment. Thank you." You know, I, they used to beat me up at school because of that name. I mean, I'm really flattered that somebody would would want it. Yeah, and you got a PR personality that took it. I, I can believe that, you know. And you, you, you'll see in, in in our film there are people who have changed their name to James Bond. You know, in one case to kind of get the attention. Yeah, yeah. Um, from it, you know. And but look, it, it does make sense. I, I've met through this film. I never knew people who changed their name uh, until I made this film. Um, but, you know, in this film, there are people who have changed their name to James Bond and then also people who have changed it, you know, away from James Bond. And you think of all the things that people do in life for self-improvement, you, mm. you know what I mean? And the amount of expense, whether that's cosmetic surgery or education yeah. or, or, or you, you know what I mean, exercise and all these kind of things. Whereas actually, if you've kind of got a long, funny sounding name, that can be a problem. And actually changing your name to a recognisable name like Cordo can give you instant name recognition. And I would imagine it probably helped her career. I don't know. At, at, as perhaps, much as five years of education having a well-known name. <laughs> perhaps somebody's listening who remembers Janice Cordeaux who will ring me up and tell me where she is. She's probably changed the name back to whatever it was in the beginning. Zero four nine one sixty five sixty eight sixty. Matt Bowers, my guest. Um, tell me the story as to how... Uh, James Bond actually came about because uh, the name was not plucked out of thin air. It was a, a famous, uh, a famous uh, bird watcher or something, wasn't he? Yeah. So I mean, a, a lot of I mean, you, you never think about this of how authors come up with 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 names for characters. But when Ian Fleming was creating the, the character of James Bond, heroes at the time had these really ornate sort of film noirish names like like you know bulldog drummond or peregrine carruthers or that <laughs> sort of thing but because bond was meant to actually be this bland anonymous secret agent fleming wanted a really bland sort of anonymous sounding name um and he was in jamaica where he was a bird watcher and he had this book called birds of the west indies by the american ornithologist james bond and you know he'd you know look at birds with his binoculars and then look it up in bond's book and he looked down and saw the name James Bond. He went, that is perfect. So he plucked that guy's name um, and used it for the character. And then, of course, when the character came out, every James Bond around the world, someone might have gone, oh, hey, there's a book with a, you know this, this character. And, and I'm sure it happens to people all the time where they go, oh, there's a character on you know, Home and Away who's got the same name as you or something. Yeah, yeah. But what happened was Fleming then did an interview where he outed this to the world's press saying, hey, I stole it from this American ornithologist. And the American ornithologist and his wife found out about this, largely because they, of course, started getting phone calls from the press and prank phone calls and this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and no one had ever followed up before what happened to, to him and the wife. Um, and what we managed to find was they'd actually done an interview on the radio with the BBC World Service in, like, 1963, and we found this kind of lost interview with the two of them. Uh, where they talk about what happened and their whole reaction to it. And what happened was his wife actually jumped in and wrote a letter to Ian Fleming saying, I'm not happy about you Uh-oh. stealing my husband's name and we should sue you. And Fleming, 
actually wrote back to them and said, you know, I'm very sorry, you know, for, for all the harm this has caused. And he said, well, it, it, the only thing I can do in return is offer your husband the name Ian Fleming if ever he wants to name a particularly horrible species of bird after me, <laughs> which riled her up even further. And so they actually showed up at his house. They doorstepped him, if you will, by surprise and knocked on his door. And, of course, he opened the door and they said, he said, who are you? And she said, Mr. and Mrs. James Bond. <laughs> um, but, yes, yeah, so a, a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, the, the original James Bond, the ornithologist and Fleming actually met. And, again, we managed to... There was actually a tiny little snippet of footage of them meeting, um, which we managed to kind of find for the film, um, which you can, yeah, see in the film if you check it out. And you, you found his uh, memorial. You found his grave, too. We did. We went to a few graves for this film, yes. We went to the original James Bond's grave in uh, Philadelphia. No wonder it took you seven years to make this movie. Yeah, yeah. I I was actually at a wedding nearby and decided to make the very short seven-hour drive to kind of get that shot. Um, (laughs) And, yes, we also filmed at Fleming's grave uh, in England as well with one of our other characters. Um, Yeah, but it's, it's interesting when you're working with the dead, if, if you will, um, uh, you know, because you obviously can't interview them. So you have to kind of go through their past and sort of find all these things. But you get a weird familiarity with them. And it sounds funny, but James Bond's wife in the film, his name is Mary Wickham Bond. I feel this real kinship with her because she was one of those women who collected everything from her husband's life and put it into these scrapbooks which she then donated to their local library, you know, thinking who would ever kind of want these. And, of course, I found these, and it's like she'd, she'd assembled all the archive for my film for me. Um, and I don't know, Mary, his wife would love this film. He, she would love that someone has gone out and turned her collection of everything into a work like this. Um, and so, yes, I, I feel a real kinship with her. Then finding all of these people, because when you had the idea to do this... You'd have no idea right up front how many James Bonds there were. Well, that's what I wanted to find out. Um, And, you know, I actually went on Facebook to start with and a bit like how there's no Jeremy Cordoz on Facebook, there's no James Bond on on Facebook either. And I discovered it's because Mark Zuckerberg has a rule at Facebook, which is you can't join with a false identity. And it flags you for having a false identity if you join Facebook as James Bond. Ah. So all my characters on Facebook are Bond James or JB Bond or some sort of variant sort of thereof. So once I figured that out, I messaged just all the James Bonds I could find on the internet, you know, from sort of Instagram or LinkedIn or that sort of thing. Um, And I said, hey, have you guys got any interesting stories to tell? Um, And quite quickly they came back with stuff which was far more complex than I was expecting. I was expecting like, oh, yeah, I get shaken, not stirred jokes and all that kind of thing. Um, But weirdly, they were coming back with stories of, you know, lost fathers and missing fathers and that kind of thing. And especially a lot of the stories related to family, because we don't think about it, but, you know, we get our names from our family. You know, our parents pass our names down to us and then we pass them on to the next generation. Um, And so it is quite an intimate thing. And so for these people who were called James Bond, there is often this question of, why did my parents do this <laughs> to me? You know, mm. and and sometimes you know you'll see in the film there are some very good answers um, to that, and quite surprising. It, do you know what I thought, Jeremy? I thought obviously in the sixties they just called their kid James Bonks. They thought you know no film series is going to be going for another hundred years, or whatever. Nah. But <laughs> especially in today's day and age. I thought there'd be a lot of like dumb influencer parents who called their kid James Bond. You know, as a you know, almost like a social media stunt or something. Yeah. But I actually didn't find any like that. Generally, there was a, a very good reason. Um, uh, you know, and often we we found one family in Texas where, believe it or not, all four generations of the family are called James Bond, and it's because it's their family tradition. You know, they they would call the firstborn of each new generation, James. And, of course, once the James Bond films started, they said, well, we're not going to stop our family tradition uh, just because of these bloody films. Yeah, um, that so, makes so, sense. So they've kept it up. So, yeah, so there we found literally four, a family of four James Bonds, um, yeah, which is very sweet. I can think of all sorts of circumstances where, if you know, you get pulled over by a policeman and the guy says, what's your name? And you say, James Bond. Uh, he's not going to believe that. Or if you're writing yeah. a cheque and you sign James Bond, uh, there'd be a lot of 
Yeah. Well, there'd, there'd be circumstances where having the name James Bond would work and there'd be circumstances where it just wouldn't work. Well, I mean, definitely the point where the film turns more towards the serious is is where, when we get to what happens when you encounter the police. Because it sounds funny, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you know. But the specific thing, and these guys know the specific times where this will become a problem and the specific time is... We all, you know, we all get pulled over by the police, you know, in a car once every few years or whatever. And I'm sure you, I've had it before, where they go, "Where's your driver's license?" And you go, "Oh, so I've left it at home." <laughs> you know, I don't have it now. If your name is James Bond and you're in that situation, the police officer then is going to say, "Okay, <laughs> give me your name, sir." Yeah. When you respond, James Bond, they're going to think that you're taking the piss yep. out of them. And we step out to, of the car, sir. Yeah. Well, no. And so for all of our Bonds around the world, this specific thing has happened to them. Um, but definitely th- with the guy we found in the US, he actually ended up being put in prison for 60 days because of the incident that ensued from that. Because, of course, the police officer said, you know, what's your name? He said, James Bond. The police officer didn't believe him and then, you know, tried to arrest the man. And, of course, James then got really pissed off about this. And so he was eventually put in prison for 60 days for antagonising mm-hmm. the, the police officer through this. Um, and so it can get quite it can get quite serious because you know lying to the police is 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 a serious offence. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so a, a lot of these guys have had w- w- when things get serious and you're dealing with authority or whatever, this name can be a bit of a curse. Yeah, naming children is a responsibility. I don't know. I, I, I it's it's been in my life um, fairly organised, except for uh, my middle boy Saxon. Mm-hmm. And Saxon was supposed to be a girl. Mm-hmm. And I, I was fairly busy at the time and I would go in there and see uh, my wife and the, the nurse would uh, pick up the little bundle of joy yes. and bring it over to the window and, you know, I'd smile and sort of say, that's wonderful. Uh, and um, uh, we hadn't a name. We had yep. only thought of a girl, a yes. girl's name. Yep. So, so the, the next thing was that uh, they gave me a, a book. Yes, which was uh, one one thousand and one baby names. Baby names. Yep. Yes. yes. Um, anyway, they uh, that didn't work, and I just had to run back to the studio and go on with life. And then eventually, um, uh, it became quite pointed. So yes, okay, I'll take the book. I'll, we'll take the book. I'll take the book. Yes. And uh, I, I, it said on the front of it, uh, one thousand and one uh, Anglo-Saxon names. Yes. So yes. I, I said Anglo Cordo, that won't work. Uh, Saxon, uh, yes, that, that'll work. That'll do. That'll do. So I handed back the book and I yes. said, "His name is Saxon." <laughs> so you can write, uh, take the question mark off the bottom of the crib because that's a little. Yes. So uh, write Saxon across so there. You just and took that's the it. title of the book. You didn't open it up. You just didn't got open off the, the book. You, you went that that one will do. True story. Got it straight yep. off the cover. <laughs> yeah. No. And look, I'm sure for Saxon. That's become, you know, he's a Saxon, I'm sure. And I think, you know, it's weird in this world. We don't think about, we think about a lot of things in this world. And, of course, it's not the most important thing, but I think we don't think about how much our name has an effect on our lives. You know when you know someone called Tracy, you're like, oh, she's such a Tracy. You can't imagine Mm. her having a different name, you know. And I'm sure Saxon, you can't think of Saxon as as a Christopher or something. No, no, no. I figured I was a warrior, so we might as well make him a warrior. Yes, (laughs) Might might work. Eh, I don't know. But then there was the uh, Johnny Cash song about a boy named Sue. So his his name was Sue. Yes. Just to toughen him up because uh, the father knew that he wouldn't be there in life to help him along the way. So he'd have to get tough. Yes. Or 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 else. So I, yes. I guess there's a lot to uh, naming a naming a, a a person. Did you find anyone named James Bond who just didn't want to know about the project? Yeah, we found a few that didn't want to know about the project. Generally, the ones who kind of had a certain level of profile or success already didn't want to know about it because I think a lot of those guys had become successful kind of in spite of the name and have become known for themselves. So there's there's a guy in uh, Los Angeles who runs a shoe company which is quite successful called Undefeated Clothing and his name's James Bond. And he, you can tell from him, he tries to avoid the James Bond thing like the plague. He wants to be known for his shoes, not for being a guy called James Bond. Um, There's also a guy that, 
don't know if you've ever seen the Bond film The Living Daylights, um, but it's, it was filmed in 1987 in Gibraltar. Oh, yeah, so they yeah. were filming the movie there, and you know it's a British army base there. And there was a British army officer called James Bond, and of course they wheeled him out to get a photo with Timothy Dalton, and it was all a big joke and that sort of thing. And of course that photo then went around with all of his local newspapers back in England or whatever in those days. And so of course I wanted this guy in the film, you know, the James Bond who met James Bond. And I wrote letters to him and his family and no response. And eventually I went and knocked on his door uh, where his wife came out and said, leave our family alone. We don't want to do your stupid move. But she explained afterwards that once she calmed down, that that they'd had a thousand requests like this over the years, you know, what I mean? from the local news or from, you know, TV shows mm, wanting yeah. to do a story on them. Um, and these guys who are called James Bond, they do get all of these weird requests all the time. You know, we had one who was, there, there was in his little town, there was a hotel opening and the owner of the hotel had decided that the big publicity event was that James Bond was going to land in a helicopter, uh, you know, and, and, and open his hotel. And you have a lot of these things, that, you know, you have, you can imagine your know, local used car salesman and that kind of thing, get this idea to use a real guy called James Bond. And you'll see in the film, we have one of our James Bonds in New York doing a commercial for a local casino mm. who wants James Bond to advertise their casino. And so for all these guys, they do kind of have their guard up a bit because they get a lot of strange phone calls. Yeah. Well, the thing is, if you want to see the movie, because you've had uh, uh, various um, um, movie festival kind of releases and things like that. Yes. Uh, what happens now? Because uh, I saw it on uh, SBS On Demand. Yes. So, yeah, the film is out right now on SBS On Demand. Um, it is only there until the 30th of this month. So it's only on there for about 29 days from now. Um, so if you want to see it, you can watch it, well, for free um, on SBS On Demand, which is great. They've been awesome partners. It's also available on an Australian documentary streaming service called DocPlay. Um, yeah, so it's available on those. And if you search for it on Amazon, it comes up there on Dot Play as well. Well, it looks very classy. I mean, it looks very expensive. You said it was cheap, but it looks very well done. And uh, as I say, I, when I looked at it, I thought, wow, for, for your first movie, uh, you've set yourself a very high standard. What's going to be next? Uh, so I'm actually working on a film called Ethanol uh, at the moment. Ethanol, you may know, is the actual drug inside alcohol. Um, it's the drug that people are using when they drink. I thought it was something um, that came out of sugar cane. Uh, well, yes, the, the actual the actual chemical the the actual chemical yeah. is, is is called ethanol. Ethanol, um, which is a type of alcohol um, that, that's in there. Um, and so I'm doing a documentary on that. Weirdly, in the in the documentary space, which obviously has hundreds of documentaries on cocaine and prescription medication and that kind of thing. Yep. There isn't actually a documentary on the world's sort of alcohol problem. Um, and so that's that's what I'm doing next. And what's the uh, thrust of it? I mean, are you uh, a- anti or are you... Uh... Very anti, actually, oh. yeah. It, it, it is, I mean, I mean, alcohol is the world's largest drug problem. Yep, um, yep, yep. Um, it is, you know, and, and you know, you, you hear so much in the media about, you know, fentanyl and heroin mm. and all these kind of things. But if you actually look at it in terms of pure death numbers, you, you know, alcohol kills 10 times more people around the world than all these other drug problems combined. Mm. Um, and I think surprisingly there isn't a, a documentary on this, and especially in the documentary space, which covers pretty much everything but else. Th- does it strike you uh, as perhaps... Uh, being the reason that there isn't a documentary. Well, I think people, maybe a lot of people don't want to hear it, but but I, but I do think in terms of balance, I think that, that, you know, the alcohol industry has, you know, a lot of advertising. You know, every time I walk through an airport, you know, the, you walk through the duty-free store. Every time you watch the football, you know, there's there's a logo on the pitch and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And, and, I, and I think it's fair to, to, to have a film that has a good look at, at what the downsides of this are and, you know, what the downsides of this world are, which are... Pretty massive, actually. You know, I mean, when you get into the statistics on this kind of thing, even just, even just, you know, just murder, Jeremy. You know, good, good old classic murder. Yeah. Uh, you know, half of murders are committed on this substance. You, you know, and I think mm. like that's a massive number. I mean, if it was another drug out there, if there was some prescription medication that half of all murders were committed on, it would be an international scandal. But with alcohol, we kind of just 
just sort of accept that, you know. When, when you hear, oh, half of all murders are committed on booze, you go, well, that sounds about, well, about I did, right. Well, I didn't know that. I hadn't thought about that. But oh. there's probably just so much money involved in one way or another in the making of and the marketing of uh, and the celebrating with yeah. booze. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's incredibly ingrained in, in our society. Well, especially in Western societies, it's incredibly ingrained. Um, and, yeah, I think we had, we're doing a film which is just having a proper look at that. I, I went looking for a film like that a few years back and I was surprised I couldn't find one, actually. You would think, you would think there's a film... About this, what, what about what about some of the old Al Capone uh, movies about uh, the days of prohibition? Which, and I guess that's what's yes. going to be trotted out. Uh, in, in, anybody who wants to control the, the uh, uh, presence of alcohol in in society, uh, they'll say, "Well, look, prohibition didn't work." Yeah, no, well, no, I don't think prohibition did work, and I, I I don't really think getting into the kind of banning or legalization of things is sort of really is really the kind of point we're going for with this. Because yes, I think banning alcohol just created a a, a black market for it, which caused yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of problems. Yeah. Um, but I think you know individuals, I think you know, do make their own informed choices. Uh, you know, you know, if if they want to drink or you know how much they want to drink and that kind of thing. And I think this film, I think, will be adding to the information for that informed choice. Um, but no, certainly, I, I think once you get into the legalization or you know decriminalization of drugs and alcohol, I think that 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 that's a whole other thing, um, you yeah. know, for politicians or others to figure out. And frankly, something I don't think that politicians and the decision makers have ever figured out for this kind of thing. Um, you, you know, you, you look at the kind of marijuana legalization in the USA, for instance, you know, mm. and you can go back and forth forever on whether that's a good thing. Um, or not, but but no, I mean, I, I personally don't believe that you're you're trying to ban alcohol. Um, de- definitely, what organisations like the World Health Organisation are doing a lot of these days is trying to push things about, you know, how much you can advertise this to children, you know, what sort of things you can market to sort of younger people for this kind of thing. Um, the issue of things like sports, you know, to get into it, the issue of things like sports sponsorship is considered a big problem because, you know, what, yeah. what they'll do is they'll put, you know, a beer logo on the pitch at the World Cup, right? Mm-hmm. And that might be in one country. Now, if Australia has a law saying that you can't advertise alcohol to children, that circumvents that law. And so that's the kind of thing which a lot of government organizations are sort of trying to get onto to kind of reduce yeah, yeah, drinking yeah, yeah. numbers these days, rather than trying to make something illegal, um, which which is a, is a whole other ball game. Yeah, but if you went through uh, all of the, um, the pernicious and terrible things that we seem to sort of be able to live with or have come to learn to live with, I mean, gambling, for example, um, yeah, 200... Billion dollar a year business in Australia alone, yeah, uh, and that's probably not. Um, it's probably a, a, a low on the low side in mm. terms of the uh, the estimate, and the the damage that some of these things do to society and the people living in or trying yeah. to live in society, incalculable, incalculable. I would think. Yeah, and we sort of we sort of just accept it. I mean, especially. I, mean, I always find it funny coming back here to Australia, especially on the gambling issue. Hmm. The amount that it goes on in this country is is, oh. is a lot. I mean, say in the USA, they've only just made you know betting on sports legal there very recently. You, you know, and you're kind of you know in the UK, you might have they call them like fruity machines in a pub, and they're kind of like a pokey, but they're more yeah. of a fun game where you might win twenty pounds at the end. Um, and you come back here, and you know, there's a mini casino in every pub. Yes. Seems insane. Uh, growing up here, I thought it was normal, but now I come back and I go, yep. "What? There's there's a miniature casino at, at the at the pub." Um, yeah, yeah. But, but then you've got to actually think about the fact that uh, we had the opportunity here in South Australia of looking over the border to New South Wales, and we could see what an awful decision it was to put them into the pubs and the clubs. Yep. And we had a willful decision to just, okay, let's do it. Yep. Let's do it. And I think it was about uh, the government being the real poker machine addict. Let's take the peps. Uh, Matt Bowers, my guest, and Matt's just handing me over a, a, oh, wow. 
It's very rare collectible. The Jeremy. other fellow, that, James Bond. Yes. Now that is signed by James Bond and James Bond. Um, it's a very rare collectible, so I'm sure we're worth a lot of money one day. Right. Are, like, are you giving this to me, or just letting me look I'm at it? I'm giving it to you, Jeremy. That, oh, that thank is you. you. I thought it would go well in your pool room, as they'd say. Well, uh, so it's straight to the pool room. Straight to the pool room. Exactly. Absolutely. What are you calling the ethanol movie, by the way? It's called ethanol. Just actually. ethanol. It is called ethanol. Yes. Thank um, you for that. I'll I'll treasure that. That's great. Thank you. I'm a great collector of just about anything and everything, and that that is very good. I I thought yes yes it's very rare to have something actually signed by James Bond. No, um, thank so you very actually much. Actually, two James Bonds. Two so that, James Bond. If you've seen the film, you, you'll see the, the the Swedish James Bond. Yes, who, yes. Who's early on the start of the film? Who's he takes it very seriously. He takes it very seriously. <laughs> so so this this one this one at the bottom right there is 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 him the Swedish James Bond. Um, yes, and obviously that wasn't his name to begin with, so he's had to learn a new <laughs> uh, a new signature uh, for that. Um, um, yes. I wonder what it is about movies. My brother was uh, deeply involved in movies and uh, he, all his life he pursued the business of making movies, mm-hmm. mostly documentaries as well. Uh, my eldest son, uh, Christian, is over in America in L.A. trying to make his way in making movies. Yep. Saxon wants to be an actor. Yep. Um, and my youngest, Christopher is uh, deep in making movies and he got into the special yes. effects side of making okay. movies. What is it about it? I mean, it would have to be, apart from radio, of course, yes. the most unreliable kind <laughs> of industry to want to be in. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny. I mean, it's a good question. I would say for your family, I guess they've kind of grown up in the entertainment industry, you know, you know, to yeah. some degree. And I think there's often you do have those sort of entertainment industry kind of families, um, you know, that sort of go on. Um, but I don't know what it is with film. I think for me growing up, I was always just the film kid, you, you know, the, the kids that were into, you know, you know, sport or football, that kind of thing. For me, it was kind of always the kind of cinema. Yes. Um, and I think especially these days, here's the thing. When I was younger... The idea of going into the film industry, you would say to your kids, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Go, you know, yeah. go, go get yourself a real job in banking. Become or an like accountant that. or a banker or yeah, uh, but something. Films, especially these days in the age of streaming, um, you know, the actual amount of content being produced these days is quadruples on what it used to be kind of 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so there's a huge amount of content being made. And especially these days, there's a lot of kind of tax breaks and incentives. A lot of that is now being made outside of America. Um, and I think we were speaking yesterday that your 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 son was working on I think Ron Howard's yes. last film, which was filmed in the Gold Coast, and they were doing post production here in Adelaide yeah, yeah, and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. And if you look at say the SA Film Corp here these days, they've just done a film. Well, they didn't do a film, but they supported a film called Talk to Me, um, which is this local horror film, which has become like an absolute worldwide sensation, has made hundreds of millions of dollars and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and in the UK where I'm based as well, I mean, they now go into schools, you know, on career day and really try and get young people to go into the film industry because they don't have enough local people to fill oh. the number of jobs in the kind of industry there. Um, and so I think it is becoming much more of a kind of reliable, stable sort of profession these days. Yeah. Um, and especially on a, on a lot of levels in the film industry, it is sort of a blue collar job if you know what i mean and you know constantly always you know you you want to know people who've got a stable reliable income it's always been the carpenters <laughs> the builders yeah. you, you know those the, the, those kind of things you know most you, when you think of millionaires right jeremy it's not the entrepreneurs who've gone bankrupt 20 times it's the guys who've run a good carpentry company <laughs> for, for, for 20 years mm. and actually the film industry is, is mainly you know carpenters set builders truck drivers electricians big multiplier um, yeah. yeah it is and so I, I think these days much more it actually is quite like like a good industry which you know you, you, sh- you should be happy if your children are going into there is there is an occasional day of glitz and glamour um mm. you, you know for, for all of your years hard work you get mm. five minutes on a red carpet sometimes <laughs> um, and i think people often think that's you know all it is but behind the scenes it is it's it's a huge amount of hard work and late nights and yeah. 
um, you, you know, you know, cr- crushing feelings of, you know, is this working or not? Mm-hmm. Well, it's um, great to see you. Thank you for uh, braving the roadworks out there. I, I was worried about that. I tried to get a message to you to say, expect delays or whatever the... Thank you very much. I didn't, I didn't have my gadget-laden Aston Martin to uh, get past <laughs> the bitumen layers of Glen Osmond this morning, um, but I just I parked my hatchback around the corner. Well, good luck in all you do, and thank you for sparing the time to come and see us, and thank you for my my James Bond, the other fellow it's called, uh, SBS On Demand. Go and have a look at it. For uh, You know, you really should be greatly congratulated on it. Beautiful effort. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for checking it out, Jeremy, and, yeah, I hope some of your listeners have a look as well. Mad bow, ladies and gentlemen.